Continued by popular demand, Franz Hartmann, Magic, White and Black. Chapter 4, Life. I never was not, nor shall I hereafter cease to be. Bhagavad Gita. The universe of forms may be compared to a kaleidoscope in which the various forms of the original energy manifest themselves in an endless variety, appearing, disappearing, and reappearing again. As in a kaleidoscope, the pieces of variously colored glass do not change their substance, but only change their positions. And, through the delusive reflections of mirrors at each turn of the instrument, are made to appear in new constellations and figures. So the one life, manifesting itself, appears in an infinite number of forms and colors, acting as matter or force, unconscious or conscious, blind or intelligent, voluntary or involuntary, from the atom, whose auras and others rush through a common vortex, invisibly but nevertheless substantial, up to the blazing suns whose photospheres extend over millions of miles, and from the microscopic amoeba whose protoplasm manifests only the rudiments of instinct, up to perfect man whose intelligence conquers the gods. Forms are isolated and materialized thoughts. If you can hold on to a thought and isolate it from others, you call into existence a form. If you can impart to that form your consciousness, you may make it conscious. If you can invest it with the element of matter, you may make it visible and tangible. But few persons are able to hold on to one single thought, even for one single minute of time, because their minds are wavering and flickering. Few can transfer their consciousness because they cannot voluntarily forget their own selves. Few can control the element of earth because it is their master, and they are attracted by it. The prototypes of all forms exist in the astral light, which is the universal soul, in which resides the universal mind. The akasha, or universal matter, being its more material substance. If a form comes into existence on the physical plane, its growth is simply a process by which something that already exists becomes visible and material, or to speak more correctly, a lower state of vibration of the same element. This something is the idea or character of the form, and as each character is a unity, such a character will be distinctly expressed in all parts of the form. A human being, for instance, will not have the body of a man and the head of an animal, but its human character will be expressed in all its parts, and as the character constituting humanity is expressed in all human individuals, so is the character of an individual expressed in all its parts. This is a truth upon which the doctrines of astrology, phrenology, chiromancy, physiognomy, etc. are based, which, if rightly understood, are not only possibly true, but must be necessarily and unavoidably true, because nature is a unity. The nature of an animal, a plant or a man, is a unity and is therefore expressed in all the parts of each respective form. It can be scientifically demonstrated that each component part of an organism is a microcosm, in which are represented the principles composing that organism. We may, by examining a part of a leaf, know that it comes from a plant, and by looking at an animal substance see that it came from an animal or by testing even the most minute part of a mineral or metal, know that it belongs to the mineral kingdom. Likewise, we may read a man's character in his hands or face or feet, or in any other part of his body, if we have acquired the art of how to read it correctly. These things are known to the physical sciences, but if the power of interior perception is once attained, a still greater world of wonders is opened before the astonished sight of the seer. He will then perceive that every part of an organism bears the correct impression of the form of the whole, and upon each particle is photographed by the astral light, the picture of the body to which it belongs. The sun's and planets in space, as well as all terrestrial objects, have their souls, else they could have no bodies, 
because their bodies are only the external expressions of the soul, and their character rests in their souls. Their souls act upon each other and are acted upon by all. And as the characters of these souls change, so change the physical forms. These astral influences constituting the soul of the universe build up all forms. They modify the character and the growth of minerals, plants, and animals. They are the cause of endemic and epidemic diseases. They evolve in the course of ages, variously shaped animals. They predetermine to a certain extent the destiny of men and furnish the energies whose character impresses itself upon everything. Their signatures may be seen in the book of life belonging to every form, in the size and shape of features and limbs, in the lines of the hands, in the color of eyes and hair. They are the forces by which the universal mind puts his mark upon everything, and those who are able to read may find the true history of everything written upon the leaves of its soul. Likewise, every individual mind prints his character upon every one of his thoughts, words, and acts, and upon the soul of everything which comes within his sphere. Upon this law is based the science of psychometry. By this science we may obtain a true history of past events, by psychometrically examining a stone taken from a house, we may obtain correct information in regard to the former or present inhabitants of a house, or a fossil may give a true description of antediluvian scenery and of the mode of life of prehistoric animals or men. By the psychometrical examination of a letter, we may obtain information about the person who wrote the letter and also of the place in which the letter was written. If this art were universally known and practiced, criminals could be detected by examining psychometrically a piece of the wall, the floor, or the furniture of the room in which a murder or robbery was committed. It would make an end to convicting of innocent persons on circumstantial evidence, or to letting the guilty escape for want of proof, for the psychometer would by the superior powers of his perception with the spiritual eye, see the murderer or robber or counterfeiter as plain, as if he had seen them with his external eyes while the deed was committed. Each form is the external expression of a certain character which it represents, and as such it has certain peculiar attributes which distinguish it from other forms. A change of its character is followed by a gradual change of the form. An individual who becomes degraded in morals will, in the course of time, show his degradation in his external appearance. Persons of a different appearance and different characters may, in the course of time, as their characters harmonize, resemble each other to a certain extent in appearance. Forms of life belonging to the same class and species resemble each other, and each nationality has certain characteristics expressed in the individuals belonging to it. A full-blooded Irishman will not easily be mistaken for a full-blooded Spaniard, although the two may be dressed alike. But if they both emigrate to America, their children or grandchildren will in time lose the national characteristics which their ancestors possessed. Change of character changes the form, but a change of external form does not necessarily change the character. A man may lose a leg and become a cripple, and still his character may remain the same as before. A child may grow into a man, and still his character remain that of a child, unless modified by education. These facts are incontrovertible proofs that the character of a being is more essential than his external form, that the form is elusive, and that the reality is a principle which is independent of form. If the character of an individual were to depend on his inherited form, children born of the same parents and educated under the same circumstances would always manifest the same mental characteristic. But it is well known that the characters of children often differ widely from each other, and they may possess characteristics which either parents do not possess. If, 
as it frequently happens, children show the same or similar talents and intellectual capacities as their parents, such a fact is by no means a proof that the parents of the child's physical body are also the parents or producers of its intellectual germ. But it may be taken as an additional evidence of the truth of the doctrine of reincarnation, because the spiritual monad of the child would be naturally attracted in its efforts to reincarnate to the bodies of parents whose mental and intellectual constitution would correspond nearest to its own talents and inclinations developed during a previous earthly life. Characters may exist independent of external conditions. The latter can only modify but not create the former. The best soil will not produce an oak tree unless an acorn is present, and a cholera bacillus will not produce cholera where the predisposition to that disease does not already exist. Forms may facilitate the development of character, but they do not create it. And persons that appear in every respect alike may be of a very different character. How can we account for such moral and intellectual discrepancies in forms that are merely alike as long as we shut our eyes to the truth that that which is essential in being, whether rational or irrational, is its character and that its form is only the external expression of that internal and invisible character, which may survive after the form has ceased to exist and after the dissolution of the form finds its expression again in another form? Forms die, but their character remains unchanged after their death, preserved in the astral light, like the thoughts of a man stored up in his memory, after the events that called them into existence have passed away. A character does neither die nor change after it has left the form, but after a time of rest in the subjective state, it will re-embody itself again in a newborn objective form to grow and change its nature during the life of the form. Seen from this standpoint, death is life, because during the time that death lasts, that which is essential in a form does not change. Life is death because only during life in the form the character is changed, and old tendencies and inclinations die and are replaced by others. Each form is an incarnation of a certain character. Our passions and vices may die while we live. If they survive us, they will be born again. The character of an oak exists before the acorn begins to grow, but the growing germ attracts from earth and air such elements as it needs to produce an oak. The character of a child exists as such before the physical form of the child is born into the world and attracts from the spiritual atmosphere the elements to which its aspirations and tendencies are attracted. Each seed will grow best in the soil that is best adapted to its constitution. Each human monad existing in the subjective state will be attracted at the time of its incarnation to parents whose qualities may furnish the best soil for its own tendencies and inclinations and whose moral and mental attributes may correspond to its own. The physical parents cannot be the progenitors of the spiritual germ of the child. That germ is the product of a previous spiritual evolution through which it has passed in connection with former objective lives. In the present existence of a being, the character of the being that will be its successor is prepared. Therefore, every man may be truly said to be his own father, for he is the incarnated result of the personality which he evolved in his last life upon the planet, and the next personality which he will represent in his next visit upon this globe is evolved by him during his present life. The development of a plant reaches its climax in the development of the seed. The development of the animal body reaches its climax in the capacity to reproduce its form. But the intellectual and spiritual development of a man may go on long after he has acquired the power of reproduction, and it may not have reached its climax when the physical form is on a downward path and ceases to live. The condition of the physical body may undoubtedly furnish facilities for the development of character in the same sense as a good soil will furnish facilities for the growth of a tree, 
but the best soil cannot transform a thistle into a rose bush, and the son of a good and intellectual man may be a villain or a dunce. As a primordial essence proceeds to manifest itself in forms, it descends from the universal condition to general, special, and finally individual states. As it ascends again to the formless, the scale is reversed, and the individual units expand to mingle again with the whole. Life on the lowest planes manifests itself in an undifferentiated condition. Air has no strictly defined shape. One drop of water in the ocean shares an existence common to all other drops. One piece of clay is essentially the same as another. In the vegetable and animal kingdom, the universal principle of life manifests itself in an individual form. Still, there is little difference between individual plants, trees, animals, and men belonging to the same species, and the peculiar attributes which distinguish one individual form from another cease to exist when the form disappears. That which essentially distinguishes one individual from another is independent of form, and exists after the form has ceased to live. Distinctions of form are perishable, but distinctions of character remain. Those attributes which raise their possessors eminently above the common level begin at a state when external appearances cease to be of great consequence. Socrates was deformed, and yet a great genius. The size of Napoleon's body was not at all in proportion with the greatness of his intellect. Honor and fame rise above the grave of the form, and the influence of great minds often grows stronger as the bodies that served them have turned to dust. Strong minds expand far beyond their physical form while they live. They do not die when the form disappears. Their characters continue to exist and may reappear upon earth. All characters may become reincarnated or re-embodied after they have left the form, but if an individual has no specific character of its own, the common character belonging to its species or class will be all that, after leaving the old body, can enter the new. If an individual has developed a specific character of its own that distinguishes it from its fellows, that individual character will individually survive the dissolution of its form, because the law that applies to the whole or to the class will also apply to the part. A drop of water mixed in a body of water will become dispersed in the mass. It may be evaporated and condensed again, but it will never again be the same drop. But if a drop of some ethereal oil is mixed with the water, and the whole is evaporated in a retort, it will, after being condensed, form again the same individual drop in the mass. A high character may lose its individuality during life and sink to the common level, but if it has established a distinction from others, its individuality will survive the death of the form. To accomplish a change of character, an individual form is required. To build up an individual form, a character must exist. If we wish to produce a form, we must first decide upon its character. A sculptor who would aimlessly cut a stone without making up his mind as to what form he desired to produce would not accomplish anything great. The form is a temple of learning for the character in which the latter gains experience by passing through the struggles of life. The harder the struggle, the faster may the character of the individual be developed. An easy life may increase the size of the form, but will leave the character weak. A hard struggle may weaken the form, but will strengthen the spirit. Forms grow at the expense of other forms. The growth of character induces other characters to grow. Forms grow weak when they impart their own substance to others. Characters grow stronger while they impart to others their strength. Individuals vampirize each other as long as they require material forms, but a character that has once been formed finds the source of its strength within itself. In the lowest plane, where the physical life impulse acts very slow, an isolated form may exist for a considerable time. 
A stone or a diamond may last for ages because the consuming fire of life is not very active in them. But in forms in which life is very active, permanent isolation is not compatible with the existence of form. The higher we rise in the scale of life on the physical plane, the smaller grows the possibility of enduring isolation. An isolated scrub pine may live surrounded by snow and ice on an almost bare rock, where no highly organized life can exist, and an animal life may live a comparatively isolated existence in a forest where a man would soon starve to death. Life in forms requires other forms to feed upon. Characters are self-existing. They require the contact with other characters only to try their own strength, and as they grow and use their power, they increase their own fortitude. The attributes which constitute character are formless. They may be expressed in a form, but after the form is dissolved, they return to the formless again. Abstract ideas such as good, evil, wisdom, power, love, hope, faith, and charity, etc., have no forms, but they may characterize a living being and render it good or bad, wise and powerful, etc. Still, such qualities do exist, even if they are not manifest in forms. Forms cannot create their own attributes, but they are the expressions of principles which exist, and which may or may not become manifested in forms. The spirit, or character, is the originator of form. The astral forces of nature are the architects, and the physical plane of nature furnishes the material to render the form substantial, and to enable it to come into contact with the physical plane. Thought is the great power by which forms are called into existence. The thoughts of a person during life determine the tendencies of his soul while in the subjective state, and these tendencies attract other influences and bring him again into contact with form. An entity attracted by the illusion of self may fancy itself to be something distinct and isolated from the universal life and look upon all other existences as being distinct from the whole. From this illusion arise innumerable other illusions. From the sense of self arises the love of self, the desire for the continuance of personality, giving rise to greed, avarice, envy, jealousy, fear, doubt and sorrow, pain and death, and to the whole range of emotions and sufferings, which frequently render life miserable and afford no permanent happiness. If a person is miserable and can find no happiness in himself, the surest and quickest way for him to be contented is to forget his own personality and to live in others by blending his own consciousness with that of some others or all. By feeling with others he will forget his own self and for the time being cease to experience the sufferings produced by the illusion of self. A person who lives in a state of isolation on the emotional plane will care for nothing else but for his own personality. He concentrates all his energies into himself and becomes more and more insignificant and spiritually small. Gradually he will sink to lower planes of thought, becoming, so to say, more and more heavy, as his soul becomes dense, and if once the downward impulse is given and not arrested, he will sink lower and lower until his personality, at the death of the form, disappears in the vortex, and he ceases to exist as a man in human form, having already, during life, ceased to exist as a man in a human character. When his physical body is decayed and the magnetic body dispersed, the remnant of his soul elements may still continue to exist. Its movements will be guided by its controlling emotions. It will not go whither it chooses, for having no intelligence it can make no choice, but it will go whither it is attracted by its instincts, until its energies are exhausted and it ceases to exist as a form. Thus, the animal elements of a man who was during his life a great drunkard may after his death be attracted to another living drunkard and be drawn to a grog shop. Those of a lewd person seek comfort in a brothel. Those of an avaricious person stand guard over his buried treasures, etc., 
etc., and all such remnants may have a certain amount of consciousness and memory left, and may be galvanized back temporarily into a living state by coming in contact with a medium. Thus, endless varieties of spooks, ghosts, vampires, incubi, succubi, etc., may come into existence, and there are innumerable accounts given in books on magic, occultism, and spiritualism to illustrate such facts. As on the physical plane, so on the astral plane, isolation produces starvation. An emotion to be kept alive must be fed by corresponding emotions, else it will devour its possessor. A person who loves another person or object intensely and cannot gain the object of his desire must transfer his love upon some other object, or he may perish in the attempt to suppress it. If the love is transferred to a higher ideal, it will render man happy. If it is transferred to a lower one, dissatisfaction may be the result. Stored up anger will find some object upon which to spend its fury, else it may produce an explosion destructive to its possessor. Tranquility follows a storm. The black magician who attempts to kill or injure another person by the intensity of his hatred, projected towards that person, may be killed or injured by the intensity of the force he has created, and which, if it is not sufficiently strong to affect his object, will react upon himself. Accumulated energy cannot be annihilated. It must be transferred to other forms, or be transformed into other modes of motion. It cannot remain forever inactive and yet continue to exist. It is useless to attempt to resist a passion which we cannot control. If its accumulating energy is not led into other channels, it will grow until it becomes stronger than will and stronger than reason. To control it, it should be led into another and higher channel. Thus, a love for something vulgar may be changed by turning it into a love for something high, and vice may be turned into virtue by changing its aim. Passion is blind, it goes where it is led to, and reason is a safer guide for it than the instinct. Love for a form disappears with the death of the form or soon after. Love of character remains even after the form in which that character was embodied ceased to exist. The ancients said that nature suffers no vacuum. We cannot destroy or annihilate a passion. If it is driven away, another elemental influence will take its place. We should therefore not attempt to destroy the lower without putting something in its place, but we should displace the low by the high, vice by virtue, and superstition by knowledge. There are some persons who live in perfect isolation on the intellectual plane. They are such whose thoughts are entirely absorbed by intellectual labors, having no time or inclination to attend to the claims of their spirit. They are, so to say, living continually in the cupola of their temples, the head, while their hearts are made to starve and become petrified. They concentrate all their intellectual forces into their brains, and may become very learned in regard to the small details of life on this planet, but while they concentrate their attention upon the small, they often lose their capacity to enter into harmony with the whole. Seen from the standpoint of eternal truth, they are lunatics, living in the moonshine of their own imagination, dawdling away their life among the realm of illusions, and perishing form, and neglecting that which alone is lasting and permanent. They constitute to a great extent the materialists, skeptics, and rationalists of our age. They throw away their birthright to immortality by arguing themselves into a belief in its impossibility. They may become criminals for the sake of science, disregarding the laws of humanity. Their astral corpses will continue to exist for a while after the death of their physical forms, until the intellectual power active therein is exhausted, but their spiritual aspirations having already deserted them during their life, there will be nothing left of them in the end to survive the dissolution of the soul. 
All forms that nature produces are the products of universal life expressing itself in forms. They are manifestations of the one in three, but as such, they do not possess any life of their own. There still remains the unmanifested one, which must become active in the form if the form is to live. The three rendered alive through the one produces the four, and four is therefore the number of perfection. It represents the square by means of which the universe is constructed, and which finds its symbolic expression in the life-giving influences meeting from the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. Life is universally present in nature. It is contained in every particle of matter, and only when the last particle of life is departed from a form, the form ceases to exist. It may remain for centuries inactive in a form, but when it begins to manifest itself, motion appears in the form. And the higher the form is developed, the higher may be the activity of its life. Life in a stone does not appear to exist. And yet, without life there would be no cohesion of its atoms. If the life principle were extracted from a mineral, its form would be annihilated. A seed taken from the tomb of an Egyptian mummy began to germinate and grow after it was planted in the earth, having kept its life principle during a sleep of many centuries. If the activity of animal life could be correspondingly arrested, an animal or a man might prolong individual existence to an indefinite period. Stones may live from the beginning of a manvantara unto its end. Some forms reach a very old age, but if the life impulse is once given, it is difficult, if not impossible, to arrest it. Life may be transferred from one form upon another, and the power by which it may be transferred is the power of love. Because love, will, and life are essentially the same power, or different aspects of one, in the same sense as heat and light are modifications of motion. The power of hate may kill, and the power of love has been known to call the apparently dead back to life. Love is a restoration of life and health, more powerful than all the drugs of the pharmacopoeia, and it is the universal panacea which the true physician applies. Thus, the sun is continually transferring his life, his will, and his love to this globe without losing anything thereby. There is no actual loss but merely a setting in motion of vibrations of life and light in the body of our planet by the central will fire at the center of our system, the sun. There are thousands of people sick because the sun in them is grown cold. They cannot make up their minds to be well. They cannot form that firm resolution which is necessary to set free the will at their own center into motion, so that its vibrations would induce life and health in all parts of their system. Their disease is infidelity. They are full of doubt, uncertain whether they ought to live or to die, and while we bemoan their miserable condition, they have neither the courage nor the will to be well, and instead of curing themselves, they hire a doctor to amuse them and to enable them to remain sick. Every disease, without any exception, is in the first instance caused, directly or indirectly, by a weak or perverted will or a disordered imagination. Nor could it be otherwise, because man himself and the world wherein he lives is a product of will and imagination, and there is nothing else but these two factors to act upon. The more external the disease or the accident is, the more remote is it from these original causes. But even an external accident is due to a disharmony existing between the will of subject and object, either consciously or unconsciously expressed. The origin of the majority of internal diseases can be traced to some emotion of the will, or to some inharmonious thought, to some irregular desire or some state of the mind, conceived either by the patient himself or impressed upon him by another. All things and all states are expressions of will and thought. People get sick. 
because they unconsciously will to be sick, and this unconscious action of the will is induced by the imagination. If being sick were looked upon as a disgrace and punished by the law, there would be far less sick people in the world. The more the comforts for the sick are increased, the more will there be people who need them. Many a man who hires a physician for his family thereby introduces the plague into his house. With the issuing of each diploma that creates a new doctor, a new herd of infection for the community is created, because the very sight of a doctor makes one think of disease and may cause disease, while there are thousands of sick persons that would be well today if they had never found it to be convenient to be sick. What, then, is the use of our modern system of quackery and dosing with medicine, be it legally or illegally done, if the cause of disease is not in the body but in the will and the thought of the patient? When will humanity arrive at an understanding of the eternal truth, that he who looks for redemption in external things is doomed to disappointment, while man's only true friend and redeemer is the God whom he carries within himself? Nor can any man give to another the life, the truth, or the Christ, but it is the life, the light, and the truth itself, giving itself to a man through the instrumentality of those that have been regenerated in the life and light of the Spirit of Truth. A physician or a preacher, having no faith in the power of good, and no self-consciousness of the presence of God within themselves, but are full of conceit in regard to their own learning and intellectual accomplishment, can cure neither the ills of the body nor those of the soul, for they can only create illusions and act upon the imagination of the patient, but not infuse life into his will. They are not physicians, but clowns and reciters of stories which they themselves do not believe. The true life-giving power rests in the source of all good, Quote, in him is life, and the life is the light of men, John 1, 4. Through its influence, the elements composing lower forms of existence are gradually raised into higher states. It is everywhere present, and manifests itself wherever a form is capable to respond to its vibrations. It cannot be found by vivisection nor by chemical analysis, and modern scientific books say nothing about it. Yet it is an element in which and through which we all live, and if it were withdrawn from us for a single moment we would be immediately annihilated. To be blind to the existence of the universal source of all good is to be blind to the fact that it is apparent everywhere, that grasses and trees, animals and men live and grow. Without the power of life, nothing living could come into existence. Truly, the children speak a great truth when they say that God made the grass grow. But the learned, who cannot conceive of anything that transcends their sensual perception, cannot rise to the sublime conception of a universal, supreme, and therefore divine power. Our materialistic philosophers desire to abolish their God, and it is to be hoped that they will succeed for the God of which they conceive is impotent. The supreme power of life in the universe is beyond conception. This they cannot abolish. An attempt to destroy it would have to begin with their own annihilation. Life is a manifestation of power, a function of the unimaginable cause of all existence. It must be a substantial principle, else it could not exist because no activity can take place without substance. It has no forms, but is manifested in forms. It continually advances from lower to higher forms, and as it advances, the character of forms advances with it. And now, a word from our sponsors. At Capella University, you're in control of your education. With the game-changing FlexPath format, you can set your own deadlines and move at your own pace. The faster you move, the more you save. Visit capella.edu to learn more. Discovery Plus has what you're hungry for with new original series and a supersized collection of favorites. It's the largest collection of food shows anywhere, all for only $4.99. Discovery Plus, the streaming home of food, plus so much more. Start your free trial. Look, staying healthy isn't easy. Watching your diet, hitting the gym. 
avoiding stress. But a good night's rest helps boost your overall health and wellness. And it couldn't be easier. The new Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed is the only bed that effortlessly adjusts and responds to both of you. The result? You wake up ready for anything. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. During our summer sale, save up to $500 on select Sleep Number 360 Smart Beds, plus special financing, only for a limited time. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. While we cannot control whether any ads get put in the spots allocated, we thank you for listening to those that do since they help keep this project alive. You can also get ad-free content and bonus content and videos and a private webpage by subscribing exclusively to magicwithoutfears.com for only a couple dollars a week or six dollars a month or 50 for the year. It helps a lot, plus you get emails about other exclusive things. Thank you very much. The building of the Temple of Solomon goes on unceasingly. Invisibly act the elements of nature, the master builders of the universe. Life inhabits a form, and when the form is decayed, it gathers the elements and builds itself a new house. A rock exposed to the action of wind and rain begins to decay on its surface, The elements gather again and appear in a new form. Minute plants and mosses grow on the surface, living and dying and being reborn. Until the soil accumulates and higher forms come into existence. Centuries may pass away before this part of the work is completed, but finally grasses will grow, and the life that was formerly dormant in a rock now manifests itself in forms capable to enter the animal kingdom. A worm may eat a plant, and the life of the plant becomes active and conscious in a worm. A bird may eat the worm, and the life that was chained to a form crawling in the darkness and filth now partakes of the joys of an inhabitant of the air. At each step on the ladder of progression, life acquires new names to manifest its activity and the death of its previous form enables it to step into a higher one. The principle of life is not changed thereby, nor is the sun changed when he sends his rays upon the earth. A piece of black iron is rendered luminous if exposed to heat, but remains iron for all that. Not the iron produces the light, nor the form the life, but the former manifests themselves according to the qualities of the latter. Forms are nothing but symbols of life, and the higher the life expresses itself, the higher will be the form. An acorn is an insignificant thing compared with the oak, but it has a character, and through the magic action of life it may develop into an oak. The germ of its individual life is incarnated in the acorn and forms the point of attraction for the universal principle of life. Its character is already formed, and if it grows, it can become nothing else but an oak. Buried in the earth, it may grow and develop from a low into a higher state through the influence of the highest, because the principle of life is contained in it. But however great its potency for growth may be, still it cannot germinate without the life-giving influence of the universal fountain of life, reaching it through the power of the sun, and the sun could not make it grow unless the principle of life were contained in the germ. The rays of the sun penetrate from their airy regions to the earth. Their light cannot enter the solid earth which protects the tender seed or a plant from the fiery rays whose activity might destroy its inherent vitality. But the seed is touched by the heat that radiates into the earth, and a special mode of life manifests itself in the seed. This life is not a new creation, but it is the absolute becoming manifest in a form. The seed begins to sprout, and the germ struggles toward the source of the life-giving influence and strives toward the light. The roots have no desire for light, they only crave for nutriment, which they find in the dark caverns of matter. They penetrate deeper into the earth, and may even absorb the activity of higher parts of the plant, 
but if the latter belongs to a species whose character it is to grow towards the light, its nobler portions will enter its sphere and may ultimately bear flowers and fruits. The soul of man, being buried in matter, perceives instinctively the life-giving influence of the supreme spiritual sun, while at the same time it is attracted by matter. If man's whole attention is attracted to the claims of his body, if all his aspirations and desires are directed to satisfy the desire of his material form, he will himself remain a thing of earth, incapable to become conscious of the existence of light. But if he strives for light and opens his soul to its divine influence, he will enter its sphere and become conscious of its existence. A time will arrive when matter will lose its attraction for him, and as the odor of the flower can exist after the flower and the roots from which the latter drew its nutriment have ceased to live, so will the character of that man, even after his physical body has continued to exist, consciously survive, and, having followed the attraction of the immortal law, become himself one with the law and be rendered immortal. The true elixir of life can only be found at the eternal fountain of life. It springs from the seventh principle, manifesting itself as spiritual power in the sixth and shedding its light down in the fifth, illuminating the mind. In the fifth, it is manifest as the intellectual power in man, radiating down into the fourth and controlling by the power of reason the turbulent elements of the latter. In the fourth it creates desires, calling forth life and instincts in the lower triad, and thereby enabling the forms to draw the elements which they need from the storehouse of nature. It forever calls men to life by the voice of truth, whose echo is the power of intuition, crying in the wilderness of our hearts, baptizing the souls with the water of hope, and pointing out to them the true spirit which, coming to consciousness in their heart, may baptize them with fire and knowledge, and initiate them into the eternal life. Diving deep into the practices and reality tunnels of the esoteric and the occult, check out Praxis Behind the Obscure podcast, where I interview practicing occultists, do book reviews, and much more. Check us out on YouTube, Red Circle, and many other podcast platforms. Thank you.